So virtual conferences are way more common than they were before. And we, as in hi, me, Echo, and <laughs> Barbie <laughs> over here, we think they're going to be a permanent fixture in academic and research settings. So is that good or bad? <laughs> Well, hopefully by the end of this video, we can show you some reasons why it's actually a good thing for academic and research conferences to be virtual or online. So hello, I'm Dr. Echo Rivera and I help academics and researchers and similar professionals end death by PowerPoint so we can all create engaging presentations. And as you can see, I have a special guest with me today on this video, Dr. Barbie Honeycutt. And we're doing this as a series. Um, in this video, we are going to be focusing on virtual slash online conferences, but we're also going to do a video where we talk about virtual slash online for professional development. And that's going on, wait, I don't know which way to point, Barbie's channel. <laughs> so check out the, the, the description for the link to that below. So let me give you a chance to introduce yourself, Barbie. Yeah, thank you, Echo. I am super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Barbie Honeycutt, and I work with educators uh, who want to learn how to create really engaging online and in-person learning experiences. And so our work really complements each other. So I'm just really excited to, to be joining you on this project. And I'm the creator and the host of the Lecture Breakers Virtual Summer Conference, which is what we're going to kind of talk about today, as well as the Lecture Breakers podcast. And I don't know if you want me to jump into my story, but but kind of talk about why I'm here and what we're doing here today, but I can go ahead and do that. Ooh, yeah. I mean, basically we just wanted to start by talking about why we even uh, wanted to make this video and the perfect introduction is your story. So I think it. so, because <laughs> it's a, it's a lesson learned. Let me tell you. So back in 2019, so pre pandemic, if we can all think back that far, <laughs> I actually surveyed my audience and I just asked them like, what types of professional development are you interested in? What are you looking for? And it seemed like there were two big areas that seemed to come out of that data. One was they wanted something online, which I was surprised because I do so much in-person type of training, or I used to. And also, they really wanted a chance to connect with others, like some type of community or collaboration. And so immediately when I read that data, I thought, ha, virtual conference. That will meet both of these criteria. And at the time, get this echo, there were no, <laughs> no virtual conferences in my space. M maybe what? there was one, but... <laughs> So what this is, this is like, like? <laughs> I, I mean, really, I thought, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the first. Cool. I, I will be the first to step out and, and give this a try. So, you know, by the time the pandemic rolled around in March of 2020, that's like when everything started to shut down. I was already five, six months into planning my conference. So when everybody else was like canceling at the last minute, or they were like scrambling to like get something online really quick. Like I was already almost done with, with my conference planning. So I was like ahead of the game. That was like perfect timing. So I guess you could say it looked innovative, um, but I mean, it came from my audience. They were telling me what they wanted. So if you fast forward to 2020, like that summer, I did the first Lecture Breakers Conference and it was so successful. I did it again in 2021. But what I noticed between the two years was that people were getting kind of burned out and they were just kind of tired and just kind of done because we were what 18 months into the pandemic at that time and it was like i don't know if i'm going to be able to to keep doing this conference i you know by then online conferences were everywhere i was not the new kid on the block you know putting something out there i was competing with all of these other conferences it seemed like all the higher ed conferences had moved online and so i started thinking to myself i'm like okay people are just really tired of online conferences it's not seen as novel or innovative anymore. Um, they were zoomed out because most conferences were held, you know, in a zoom space. And it just seemed like they were done watching videos and they were hungry for that in-person connection. And I honestly just thought I couldn't compete. And what I kept telling myself was I can't compete when we go back to in-person conferences. That's literally what I told my husband at dinner. It's literally like the words that came out of my mouth. And so I announced in 2021, that that's going to be the last conference. And I know you had a reaction to that. <laughs> My reaction was I was so heartbroken. <laughs> I was so sad to hear it because I, I presented and attended the first lecture breakers and it was literally 
the best conference I had ever been to. I loved it. I was able to actually, for once in my life, I think I attended every single session and I've never been able to do that before. I learned so much and it was just a perfect learning environment for me. Networking was amazing. Like it was just all the things. And so when you said this, I was just so sad. I mean, I didn't want to overstep. So I just kind of said, oh, I support you. <laughs> but I Thank was like <laughs> very internally just really heartbroken and sad. Um, so yeah, that was, that was sort of my reaction. <laughs> well, and I appreciate the support first of all, because I mean, it was very much my decision because I was still in that place where I'm like, okay, this is temporary. Once we get through this pandemic, like we're going to want to go back to in-person conferences. I just completely stayed in that lane where this is temporary. This is temporary. And I think there might be a lot of viewers out there who were thinking that too. And I think it's okay, but I really appreciated that you are sharing this with me, that you kind of, you know, supported me through the whole process, but you, as well as the lecture breakers community, they were sad. I mean, they said, you know, I reached out to them a few months after the summer conference, the most recent one. And they overwhelmingly said, Barbie, we really want you to keep this conference. And, and they had so many reasons why that I had not even considered, which is what, excuse me, what I hope we'll share in this, in this video, we'll kind of dig into some of that because I just didn't, I just didn't realize. And it hit me. It's like, I'm the one that's stuck in pre-pandemic mode where it's like going back to something that I don't think we're going to go, go back to, as you said, when we kicked off this video, you know, I was the one that was stuck. They were not. My participants were like, let's do this. We want to keep it virtual. Let's go. And they spoke loud and clear. And now I am proud to announce that I will be offering the Lecture Breakers virtual <laughs> summer conference this coming summer, as well as as long as people want to attend, I'll keep offering it in the virtual format. Yes. And anybody who was watching this attend Lecture Breakers. It's the best conference ever. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very excited about yeah. the lineup. I love the networking we've been able to do. And I know we're going to dig into that, yes. but it's really been just a wonderful experience for me too. Good. And I think, yeah, I think you're not alone. And again, that's the core of why we wanted to do this video, because I'm definitely seeing a lot of organizations that are like, we're going to do face to face, no virtual option. And I think a lot of people are, they thought it was temporary, and they want to move back to face to face only. But, you know, we're kind of hoping that that we can convince some people to, you know, believe that online is here to stay. And that's, a good thing. <laughs> right. And I, I, so one of the lead conferences in my space is going back this year to an in-person conference and the rates are more expensive and they're not offering any, you know, recordings or virtual options or anything like they did last year. And um, so I think you're right. I think we're still seeing conference organizers in that space that I was in as well. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I agree. We want to help them move forward. Yes. I, I agree. Yeah. Please, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's sort of a good time for us to start talking about some of these um, benefits that we've seen and heard for online conferences. And just to sort of uh, summarize some of the key things we're about to talk about, the main, the main few reasons that we think online and virtual conferences are great are because A, people want it. <laughs> just they like do you were talking about. Yes. Um, we think it has the potential to be more diverse and inclusive and equitable than in-person conferences if done well. Uh, the other reason is we have the technology to do it. So let's just do it. We could do this now. Whereas 20 years ago, we probably could not have. Well, and, and let me just say, Echo, that Zoom yeah. is not the only game in town for exactly. doing amazing conferences. Over the last 24 months, I've had so many new types of technology for running conferences come my way. And I've been exploring all these options and it's amazing what's mm -hmm. out there just in the last two years. So uh, the yeah. technology is there. It really has exploded. Even things like concerts, like for music, right. they're even coming up with ways to do it online. So I feel like we could do this. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, just like you were saying, like it is the new reality. So, you know, everything has shifted. We can't go back. So let's embrace it. Absolutely. So in that, um, in that line of thinking, um, one of the first things we wanted to talk about together was some of the some of the downsides, I guess, or challenges the to challenges. a virtual or online conference that we've heard from people when we've talked about this. 
And, you know, we want to propose some solutions or other ways of thinking for some of these things. So the first one is networking. <laughs> so Barbie, I know you've heard this before where people are like, but how do I network? How do I, how do I build my professional network if it's not face-to-face -face or in person? So what's sort of your first reaction to that? Well, my first reaction is echo. I've never met you in person. No. <laughs> and we've, we've done so many amazing things together yes. from the podcast to projects we have coming up in the next year to partnerships, to, um, the, the conference when you were as a presenter. I mean, there's just so much going on and I've never met you. And we met through the podcast and the conference. So, you know, you could definitely do some serious virtual networking if you put yourself out there. And so I don't think that that is something that, that can hold people back. In fact, that's, to me, it's even more valuable because you are able to maybe schedule a time with someone who you might just see in passing in a hallway at a conference or just standing around having coffee where you can actually schedule a time where you could talk to a mentor or, you know, just introduce yourself and have a 20 minute call. And so to me, I think that it it's really expanding what networking means. It doesn't just have to mean that in-person face-to-face experience. And, you know, so many of my participants in my conference talked about the, their, one of the favorite things that they love was that I offer a community as part of my conference. And I've used two different tools to do this. And the one I used most recently was the best one. And I had people who, you know, were connecting with, with each other directly. They were doing, you know, um, direct messages to each other. I was helping facilitate connections where people had questions in the, in the group. They're like, hey, does anybody know anybody who works with assessment or whatever? And so I could facilitate those connections. And it's amazing to see that grow out of the online community space and then carry forward into, you know, wherever people go beyond the conference. And so I have to shut that one down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's just not, you know, you can do yeah. so much virtual networking um, at a virtual conference. So, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I remember you making a point that some people are even excluded from mm -hmm. from the in-person experience of networking. So uh, did you want to share a little more about yeah. that? Because I thought it was a really good point. Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, yeah, we have to think of who can actually be at the conference and who can't be. And there are a lot of people who are excluded from attending an in-person conference for a variety of reasons. And we're going to get into some more specifics later on about those. But yeah, just sort of generally, there are people who miss out on networking opportunities all the time right now with in-person uh, conferences, whereas with an online conference, more people can attend. So more people are going to have more chances to build their network, first of all. And then it's just also everything that you said, where then the networking can actually become easier and more effective. Like as you were talking, I was yeah. thinking, I mean, I, I think back to the times I've been at a conference where I'm sitting in the room, I'm listening to the presentation and that's kind of all that happens. And then I might maybe network with the presenter because they were the ones who were there. I heard them speaking and there's sort of an introduction I could make like, oh, great, great talk or something like that. And same thing with a poster session, right? Typically that's where the networking happens. But when I had attended virtual conferences like yours and others, it was all the participants networking with each other because they were in the chat room responding to what the speaker was saying, which would be totally rude if people were saying those things out loud, you know, right. we, can, <laughs> we can all have our running train of thought and share things. And, and then, you know, people started networking with each other. And that's why, I mean, I, especially speaking for myself, I know I've built up my network so much faster because I'm networking, not just with the speaker, but with many, many more people who are just attending the conference. So yeah, I also Absolutely. shut that down. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I mean, there, there's certainly value in meeting people face to face totally. and we'll talk about totally. that, but I just want people to realize that we are expanding what networking means. And like you, there are people who, you know, as you said, there are people who just can't attend an in-person conference. I mean, uh, the lecture breakers conference is global. I, I wish I'd have grabbed the data, yeah. but it's at least at least nine countries were represented um, at the conference, which is amazing to me. Um, yeah. And the fact that we are on different time zones, like we're going to get into all of that. But I think you're absolutely right that we yeah. talk about accessibility in lots of different ways and networking. Yeah. We really need to redefine it. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, the other the other thing was the um, the in person connection. So, you know, we definitely hear from people who are like, well, you know, conferences are the only way that I can see friends, you know, colleagues, uh, family, or travel and visit new places. So. I'll pass this to you for the yeah, and I mean, <laughs> so I'm a person who you know as part of my business. I have been on lots of stages for keynotes. I've done lots of you know pre-conference sessions. I've also been a vendor at event at, at conferences. Oh, so God. you know, I've I've done all the roles, and it's amazing to me that the virtual space can make so much more happen. Like you said, you can watch the chat. You can see what's happening. There's no way you can do that in person. You know, as a keynote speaker, I could never get a glimpse into everyone's thinking like I can when I'm scrolling through the chat. Um, so I just wanted to make a point to say that mm -hmm. because that, that, was, that was something that really stood out to me and something that I really enjoyed as a speaker. But yeah, I mean, there's other ways to get together in a virtual space. I mean, you can still have like virtual coffee. I know I have a lot of colleagues who will get together at a, at, you know, in person at a physical in-person conference and they coordinate schedules and everything, and they try to have like dinner together. But I mean, you can do that virtually. You know, you can say, hey, everybody at 8 p.m., let's all get together and, and have coffee or dessert or whatever. And you can still do that in the online space. And, you know, it's it's also likely that you're not going to leave someone out. Like, I remember um, a group of colleagues, everyone had written, you know, a book that came out in the last couple of years, so they all wanted to get together. But I also remember thinking, wow, if I had written my book, but I couldn't attend, like, I would feel left out of that experience. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities for more people to join in when you do things virtually. So and I'm <laughs> so glad that you said that because the idea, the thought in, in my mind was once again, I sort of want to, you know, shine some light on this, um, shine some light on how not everybody can attend an in-person conference. And right. Again, you know, especially speaking from experience, I mean, there have been conferences I really wanted to go to, but I couldn't. And I was just so sad because it was like all my friends were getting together, but I couldn't be there and I was left out. So I've been that person who Sorry. has been left. I mean, it was fine. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it's know, true. It's yeah, still, not everybody can attend. So, you know, I do think it's important that we are, you know, when we have these sort of first thoughts that we sort of challenge and question that and, you know, think, does, is that actually happening for everybody right now? And I kind of argue that it's not. And, it's not. <laughs> you know, I also think, I don't want to go into too big of a rant here, but I also think part of this is also, you know, maybe we can look to our culture a little bit. And because even when I have gone to a conference and I have joined the you know, fun social events, you know, the whole, the conference itself was expensive. I was worried about money. I was stressed out about my presentation. I had to do all these sessions. I had to wake up early, you know, that kind of thing. So I didn't really have that much fun, or I, I think I would have had more fun without all of that stress attached. And part of me is just like, yeah, what if we just had better like paid time off or, you know, we were, we had more vacation time so that we could get together, you know, without the stress of all of those other things. And we could spend more time with each other and more time with friends or family or more time traveling. So I don't know. I always try to think of, of, you know, maybe there's actually a whole better way to achieve this goal. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that too, but. I, I agree with you on that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I mean, I've worn all of these hats, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, I I have taken my son and husband with me when mm -hmm. I go on a, on a job. It wasn't a conference in this case, but, yeah. um, you know, and so we go and, you know, I pay for all their stuff myself and, mm -hmm. and whoever's paying for me to go as a speaker, you know, that that's separate. But I'm still working. Like it, it's a family vacation, but I'm still in work mode. And yes. so I think you're right that it does speak to this bigger problem of do we have enough paid leave and support for, you know, mm -hmm. all of our professionals out there who are watching this and what does that look like? And of yeah. course that's, that's bigger than the battle yes. that I can fight little old <laughs> me in my little corner, but I think it's true. It, it sparks these bigger conversations and, you know, people who love to see new cities, love to travel. Hello, I am one of those. I mean, I jump at the chance to go to a new place. But like you say, when it's a conference environment, how often do you really leave the hotel? And how often do you have the chance to really step out and explore that city? I mean, I've been places where I could go for an hour and leave, but 
I'm not going to leave for half a day to go explore when I'm supposed to be at this conference, which is a professional learning experience. So I think keeping that in context will be, will be important to think about as well. Absolutely. And same yeah. here. I mean, that was, I mean, I am speaking as someone who most of my travel has been because of conferences and I would grab my partner, grab my dog, and we, we would go <laughs> on a road trip and we would even visit more than the place of, of the conference. So I've definitely experienced that benefit as well, which is why I know it, there's all this stress attached to it. I'm still working and I have way less time than I would if we just had more PTO, but it is a bigger conversation, like you said, and yep. it's not like we can necessarily fight this battle, but but um, it is important for those listening. Is that is an important too. piece of the conversation for sure. And, and um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in um, hearing what the, the audience has to say as well. I would love yeah. to know if people leave comments about, about this conversation. I'd love to see kind of where we can take this conversation next and how we're leveraging in-person conferences and doing things we can't do virtually. But I still think there's so much more we can do virtually and we just mm-hmm. need to give ourselves a chance to do that. You know, I so. agree. Yes. Yeah. And that's a perfect sort of segue into now I think it would be good to talk just in general about benefits mm-hmm. because I mean, I would say that those are the, the two biggest um, concerns that I've, I've heard is networking and not spending time with people or traveling. So I feel like we've already addressed those. And um, when it comes to the other aspects of a virtual conference, we, we sort of brainstormed a little bit before the video, just, just to make sure we had some ideas prepared, <laughs> but they all seemed to relate to um, things like a better learning environment a little bit, which I do think is a core purpose of conferences. It's, you know, one reason we like to do conferences. We like to share new insights of what's happening in the field and learn new things. And yeah, when we listed a lot of benefits, they all really enhance that goal of a conference, the, the learning environment. So um, let's see, Barbie, what sort of, um, and oh, and then we also thought of benefits to different groups of people who are part of a conference. So the first group is conference organizers and the second group is speakers. And then the third group is everybody, just everybody who attends a conference. So I don't really have experience with organizing a conference, but Barbie, you do. So (laughs) if you could share some benefits um, for conference organizers, uh, that would be great. (laughs) Yeah. So I've, I've done all of these things. I've been the conference organizer, the speaker, the participant. So this will be fun. Um, So as a conference organizer, first, let me just say that I do have quite a, a strong background in event planning and management. So when I was working on a campus, I did a lot of uh, new graduate student orientations, new faculty orientations. We did a lot of support for career days. Um, I, there was just so many events that I helped coordinate. Uh, awards, banquets, outstanding teachers, like you name it, I have probably coordinated it. So I, I do know that perspective and what it takes to pull off an in-person event. Now for actually doing a Uh, you know, an online conference or an online event. I mean, there's still a lot of logistics, but let me just tell you, it is so much easier. (laughs) So I will just dig into some of these. Like, for example, I can do and do the virtual conference all by myself. So knock on some wood (laughs) that it's gone okay. (laughs) But yes, so uh, I do hire a tech assistant just to help with like the day of stuff. Like people can't hear the the speaker or they're having tech issues, but I, I do the whole conference. Um, so I connect and reach out to my speakers. I coordinate any, you know, preparation materials. We do all of that. I do all of that myself. I don't have to have a whole team. Whereas when you're doing an in-person conference, you better have a very well-trained team. I mean, think about all the players you have to have someone to staff the, um, the table when people come and register or sign in for the conference, someone to do like, here's your name badge. Here's your check-in process. Here's your program. Uh, let me tell you where the restrooms are, right? Somebody to be that person. And then, you know, in terms of the actual like event and all the sessions, you have to keep up with like the make sure the room is clean and reset between each speaker. Uh, Does the microphone work? Does the tech work? Can people see the screen? What about the food? Have we covered enough with all of the different types of of allergies that people have? And 
you know, do we have enough chairs and there's fire codes? Oh my goodness, Echo, I have a, just a little story. But so one of my very first conferences, um, sort of on the national circuit, I was doing, I just had a session, right? It wasn't even keynote. I was just a session. And I remember I was setting everything up and I had prepared a hundred handouts. They told me to prepare for about 80 participants. I walk in the room. It's like round tables. Everything looked pretty good. I was like, okay, I got this. Well, 10 minutes into my little 45 minute presentation, I had people sitting on the floors. They were sitting beside of me on the floor, lined up down the walls, cramped. Like they didn't even have seats. I certainly did not have enough handouts. And the fire marshal actually came and closed the doors and was like, you cannot have any more people in this room. Wow. <laughs> Hey, Barbie. Which, I mean, I I don't come at it from like, oh, Barbie's this great speaker. I'm saying like people could not come to my event because they physically could not get in and they didn't have handouts and I was thrown off. Like I had to take a minute because I'm like, there are like, I can't even walk around because I'm going to step on somebody. Like it was just not ideal. Um, So, and I know other colleagues of mine who have had the same type of experience. And so you do not have to worry about all that <laughs> with your virtual space. You can have as many people as you want and mm-hmm. you can coordinate all of this and not have to worry about those kinds of stressors. I mean, yes, there are stressors with my technology work, with my internet work and things like that, but you can put protocols in a place where those things yeah. aren't going to impact your whole event. So, um, yeah, so that's just one part of yeah. event planning 101. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, I mean, it speaks to how unpredictable things can be. And when it's in person, it could be a lot harder to adjust to that. Um, whereas, yeah, like with virtual, if half the people show up or triple the amount of people show up, there's not a huge difference really. Um, so yeah, yeah you can handle easier. that <laughs> easier yeah. to scale, right? It's so yeah. much easier to scale. scale. Mm-hmm. Well, and so th- another piece I want to speak to this, and I've experienced this with this year's planning. So I'm planning the 2022 conference as we speak. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was just really excited about was I was going to try to get this year, like every year, I, I kind of pick and choose the, the the theme of the speakers that I'm looking for. And this year, I wanted to try to get speakers who had published a book in my area um, in the last couple of years, or like some big, bigger names out there that I wanted to see if would come to my little conference, <laughs> you know, and so I reached out to them 10 months before the conference. Yeah, nice. 10 months nice. before the conference, because I knew that their schedules mm. were going to book up, people were going to be looking, you know, to have them on their stages. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to just see what I can do. And so um, I, I wanted this, it's not a higher quality speaker. I'm not saying that at all. I wanted a more like a mix, like I really wanted a mix of, of speakers that were outside of of the people that I knew, like, um, I think eight of the ten, nine speakers that I have coming up this year, um, I have not met them before. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't had them on the podcast before. Like it was a total reach for me to reach out to these people and ask. And I just knew that they were going to be booked way in advance. And so the virtual space allows for them to say yes as a speaker, because they don't have to worry about, okay, if I'm traveling to whatever, California, I'm in North Carolina. So say they're traveling to California and they get an invitation to go to another conference in Texas, but it's only a day later, like, can they make that travel and will they be burned out? Like there's all of these logistics that take place for the speaker. And so again, I, I'm a speaker. That's what I do. And I know about, you know, traveling all over the, mm-hmm. the country, trying to bounce from one event to another and the time zones and the exhaustion. And so What's really cool here is I do have a couple of speakers this year, and I had a couple of speakers last year who were able to say yes to me, even though they have a conference like the day before or the day after, where they would have had to say no to me prior because they Mm. couldn't travel. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as a speaker and as a person who hires speakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something people don't think about to start coordinating. (laughs) Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, yeah. yeah. that's an example. Yeah. And it's easier on, on speakers. I mean, I I know a lot of speakers love to travel. That's how we build our businesses, but you know, it's, um, Mm -hmm. it's just something to think about as you're planning. Mm -hmm. Um, And one more thing too, I think um, just in terms of like the day of the event, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of little like event management things that we don't really think about until they happen. So one being, you know, I love an engaged audience, love it, love participants who stand up, raise their hand, do whatever it is in the in-person space, but also if they say something or are talking about it and they just kind of venture off on a tangent or take too much time, I can't mute them, <laughs> so, and I'm not being mean, 
but like you no, can no, quietly no. say okay we have a minute let's move to the next like you can facilitate that a little yeah. easier on mm-hmm. your end in an in an online conference and again I'm not going to shut anybody down <laughs> but it's just a little easier to say okay it's almost time or whatever yeah. you need to do to, to, to monitor that situation. So you, yeah. you kind of have control over that. Um, <laughs> and the other thing too, is like, unless you're bringing in technology in an in-person conference, like phones or, or laptops, which are, you know, all of, that's a whole nother issue when you try to bring laptops into a conference space, but it's like, how can you get them to do things like the polling or to fill in a, a Google doc together or to create yeah. something together. If everybody doesn't have the technology, they can't do that. Mm-hmm. Whereas in person, I mean, virtual, they can. So, yeah. um, and then last but not least, my favorite is that you can record it. Oh, <laughs> so, yes. oh my goodness. Yes. yes. So as a speaker and a conference organizer, I appreciate this on both sides. So, you know, I have been recorded when I was a speaker at a conference and I can only imagine how bad that recording was because I'm walking around the room I don't have a microphone that's hooked up to the camera like I'm sure it's a bad experience for anybody who's watching that and then you know from the conference organizers point of view like if I can record this amazing presentation and the chat and the questions people are asking and then I can make that available to my audience if they can't attend or if they want to re-watch it I mean that Mm -hmm. is an amazing feature um that's a huge selling point to me yeah I think so yeah so Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, well, the last thing I was going to say too, and I know we're not really talking about like, I know we're getting into talk about speakers a little bit, but it really, it's really more visibility for your speakers. Like, you know, if I can make a name for myself with my conference and I can be a player out there that competes with other national conferences, then the speakers who come to my conference are going to want to be there. And it gives me more opportunity to share their work and for them to market themselves. And so, um, you know, I, that's just the piece I think is really important for us to think about if you're organizing a conference, like yeah. how are you helping your speakers? Yeah, I think so too. Mm-hmm. And I, I definitely have heard from people who are organizing a conference where they're concerned, like, how do I even do this? How do I do an online? Because they're used to organizing an in-person, right? but I don't know. I just feel like all the reasons you listed are just so convincing. Like it's easier. You can get a really good mix of people and you have technology on your side to handle a lot of different uh, problems that can come up on an in-person conference. So, I mean, yeah, if you're a conference organizer watching this, I hope that you're, <laughs> I hope that you're seeing this and how, oh, this might actually make life easier. And Barbie, if you could do this, and it's just you, imagine when they have a committee and they have yes. three people. I mean. Think about all that they could accomplish, all you could accomplish if you're part of this team or community. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, it doesn't just have to be a one person show. Um, Certainly you can delegate, you can do other things. And if I keep growing my conference, then one day I may be able to do that. But I just want people listening to realize that you don't have to have 20 people as part of your team to run this, which you do Mm -hmm. if you're doing an in-person conference in a huge hotel or a huge event Mm -hmm. space. So, um, but I want to keep talking about um, the speakers because- Yeah. That's kind of your area. Um, you really focus on like the mm-hmm. presentation skills and making presentations, you know, more engaging and interactive and things like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, this is what you do. So as you know, I'm thinking of it as me being a speaker, but you actually train speakers yeah. to do what they do better. <laughs> so what do you think are some of the benefits in that regard when they're moving mm-hmm. to the sort of online space? Yeah, there's so many benefits for speakers and you have touched on on a few of them already. I think one of them is uh, w- one thing that's a lot easier in a virtual or online setting is scripting your presentation, practicing it and delivering it, which shocks a lot of people because there's a lot of hesitation, maybe not so much anymore because we've had more practice, but people have always been scared and assuming that it's harder to be engaging in an online setting and it's, it's harder to practice and harder to do all of those things, but it's actually way easier to script and practice because you can can use that notes section of PowerPoint or whatever software you're using. And it's much easier to kind of, you know, glance at it (laughs) on a screen um, than in person. Like if in person you want to walk around, you can't really use your notes as much. So you can use your notes much more and easier in an online setting, which means less practice or a different type of practice. So it's just, it's easier to create and to deliver, which I mean, we almost never have win-wins like that. So it's just so good. 
And then um, you mentioned this, which is another uh, another benefit, which is you could keep an eye on the chat. I mean, <laughs> I've given in-person presentations where I have no idea what's going on in the audience's brain. Like I like they're watching me, they're paying attention. I might get a few nods, but I still don't really know what they're thinking. <laughs> but now I can just, I, I actually use my, that's why I'm doing this. Cause I use my phone to, to watch the chat. So I don't have to close out of my slides or anything. I have another device. So we can literally watch the chat the entire time. And I can, I basically am reading people's minds. That's what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and that is so valuable because you can adjust, uh, you know, if you start seeing that people are confused about something, you can kind of pause and then address it if you want, or then you at least know that that's something you have to talk about in the Q and A and you're a little bit more prepared or, you know, or you could just use it to improve it the next time. I mean, there's all these benefits that you get from people just typing their train of thought. I mean, it's so invaluable and you don't get that with face to face. You just no, <laughs> and, and I just want to follow up. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. One of the things, so I serve as the host for my conference, right? So, so you know this because you came in, you were the speaker and I facilitated the, the introduction and I monitored the chat and I threw it to you when needed. But sometimes I have speakers who don't want to see the chat and want me to facilitate that. So I play that role. That's great. But I'm able to find those trends and say, oh my gosh, we have a lot of people who are just really confused right now. Let me jump in mm -hmm. and get this back on track, which I've had to do before. And I mean, there's no way you could do that in person, right? That just would not work. Nope. At least here, you would hear from the participants and say, look, we have a lot of people who are kind of confused about the term, whatever, flipped classroom. Can we define that for a minute? Let's just pause for a second. You know, whereas that, mm -hmm. that might've gotten lost in yep. person. So yep. um, exactly. I love, I love that. And, and uh, speaking of the Q&A too, um, I love the Q&A feature in Zoom or whatever webinar software as a speaker, because I can actually look at all the questions and I can pick and choose the questions that I think are going to be the most benefit to everybody who is watching or who, who will watch the replay. Um, because, you know, sometimes questions are just not a question. Too, oh, they're too specific, <laughs> right? It's like, I teach specific. on Wednesdays at eight o'clock, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you're like, okay, this isn't really going to help, you know, a, a lot of people at once. And so, yeah, you can sort of pick and choose the best questions. Whereas in person, it's just, oh, you're taking a risk by giving that one person the microphone and you have no idea what's coming. But when they're typed out, you can read the whole thing and then answer. So mm -hmm. I mean, as a, as a speaker, it is significantly easier, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another thing which you, you mentioned was um, the handouts. I mean, all oh, the handouts. Yes. <laughs> knowing how many handouts to bring is like, you, you cannot predict that number. And I have underestimated. I have overestimated. I have never gotten it right. <laughs> it's always been either a waste of paper or people are left upset or left out because they don't have a handout. It's just, yeah, but you don't have to worry about that in an online setting. You can have a link to Google Drive, to Dropbox, whatever. The, the webinar software might have it where people can download resources. There's all kinds of ways to give people a document and then everybody gets a copy. And you exactly. don't even have to worry about it. It's oh it's my gosh, beautiful thing. Yes, <laughs> handouts are like the bane of my existence for in person oh. because then it's like if you have extra, you leave them at the conference registration table. People might come and pick them up, or if I go and I'm a vendor, I've had people come and ask me as a vendor, like, "Hey, we saw you speak. Do you have any more handouts?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Well, I'm not even, I'm not even in that role anymore. Like, it is just such an yeah. issue, and mm -hmm. it doesn't seem that important, but it is that important because people do get left out and they get frustrated if they don't have the resources." So, yep. yeah, I also think um, this just popped into my head, but it's also easier to network. So back to networking. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're presenting, right, you, you might have a business card if people do those anymore. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or you at least put your website or social media handle on a slide. But what do people have to do? They have to either write it down and then look it up on their phone or their computer later. And people don't do that. They forget. Right. Whereas if you're presenting online, you drop that link into the chat and all people have to do is click because they're already on their computer and then they can already connect with you. So it's easier for you to build your network as a speaker because you can just share those links directly and then it just takes a click. 
I didn't even think about that, but Me you're either. absolutely right. Yeah, that's a fantastic one. <clears throat> in my head. Um, what's the what's the next one? Um, I think that yeah, just in general, I think you know a lot of people have an easy time presenting in person, and they enjoy it, and it's and it and it goes well for them. Um, but I still think that in general, an online presentation can be less stressful because of what you were saying before, Barbie. Like, there's just so many things that can go wrong, and in terms of um, presentations, the two big things that go wrong are the version of PowerPoint on the laptop is wrong. It's not the version you use. And so your fonts are all wrong. The animations yep. don't work. It's just Colors crazy. are wrong. I have been there. <laughs> I have a yeah. story. I have a story. Oh, I have so I many have stories, you go first. but you I go have first. to share. I'm going to share this story. This might've been this is most memorable. And I've, I've, I've been, I've facilitated a lot of workshops. I consider myself a, a good speaker. I'm confident in the space. Like, you know, I got this and I've had to deal with so many tech issues or unexpected. Like you say, the PowerPoint's wrong or the screen is wrong or the colors are, I've done all of that, but by far the worst for me was the time that I walk into this. It was a, this was like a very fancy hotel, but they were getting ready to undergo like all of this construction the next summer. So we were there kind of during their last hurrah. So I walk in and I actually have somebody co-facilitating with me. So I wasn't the only facilitator that day. And so we were tag teaming. We walk in and we look and not even kidding you, Echo, the projector for the slides was on two milk crates. No. <laughs> not even kidding. Like this, like I should have taken a picture. <laughs> So there's two milk, milk crates and we are like, whoa, because if you get too close to them, they're shaking. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. So every time they shake, the little connection at the back wiggles oh. and you lose your projection. Oh. I was like, this is a disaster. <laughs> it, was, it was the worst. So our mics kept dropping. The tech was just awful. The whole thing, we just ended up dumping all the tech and did the best we could in the room with the people. But it was like, what you're saying here, like even the best, most seasoned, most experienced presenter can lose their game when you're dealing with stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. just a total extreme, but I've absolutely had it where it's like, yeah. uh, I walk in and I don't even know what version of PowerPoint or they don't accept me plugging in my own laptop or whatever. I've done yep. all of that. And usually you can deal with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what's mm -hmm. your story? I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and then just to, just to validate that too, cause I, you know, I, I, I work with a lot of people who are doing presentations and I've lost count before the pandemic, and even now, as we go back to in-person presentations, I've lost count of the number of clients who are like, I had everything ready to go, da, 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 but the adapter that they had or the HDMI cable was frayed and, and didn't work. And it was, it was glitching and everything was plugged in, but it would go in and out. And yeah, so uh, the cord issues, milk crates is new, but. <laughs> well, there's <laughs> one for you, yes. <laughs> um. So my story is actually my dissertation defense. Oh, <laughs> I made a beautiful presentation. Okay. It was just, it was like one of my finest pieces of work. And I used my, my color scheme was a really nice light yellow and a really nice light brown. <laughs> and then I plug it in to the projector at school. And the colors, let's just say <laughs> they no longer looked nice. They they looked yeah. disgusting. I'll just mm -hmm. say that word. I'll just and you can picture what I was saying here. They yeah. looked like disgusting. And I was like, I mean, part of it was like, why did I choose those colors? But I swear on my screen, they looked really nice and pleasant. And then I look it in and it's just this awful, oh. awful shade of yellow and gross gross shade of brown and I mean I powered through and I got my PhD so didn't ruin it <laughs> right <laughs> that's what matters most but, but yeah but still that's oh. not when you want to plug something no. in and you know this thing you think is going to be beautiful is 
hideous and you know, you, you don't want that. So yeah, if it was online, it wouldn't have looked that way. It would have right. looked beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And you can test it beforehand and make yeah. sure all this mm-hmm. stuff is working. Yes. Oh yeah. I know we could, sp- I could do we a could. whole we YouTube could. channel on disaster speaking <laughs> things, but I know we're going to have to move on, but yeah, that's a, yep. that's a really, really good point yep. for speakers. I have one last good point for speakers. You can present in your PJs, at least your pants, <laughs> you know, right. your shirt, but you can present in your PJs, you can present barefoot, like, you know, or like comfy, fluffy socks, whatever. You can wear the clothes that make you feel very comfortable presenting. And for me, that is a huge advantage. Yeah. I'm in PJ pants right now. <laughs> I'm in PJ pants all the time. And I well, you see it. me, I'm always rocking a hat because I spend my day with my six-year-old. So we're playing, right. hiking, doing all these things. And I'm like, all right, I got to do video, throwing on the hat, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, I feel you on that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So that could be an advantage for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Enough about speakers. Um, let's talk now about the benefits to basically just everybody who is mm. participating in a conference, which of course can include speakers and even conference organizers. But this is more of the perspective of people who are watching um, or attending a presentation. Um, I think the first one that I wanted to mention is online conferences are so much more affordable. Like, yes, you know, so much more, no travel, no hotel, don't have to eat out. Um, Those are just like the big three in terms of travel. Um, If the conference organizers um, are are doing this, the the, um, registration fee is often more affordable. Not that might vary, but, um, but yeah, those were sort of the big ones for me was just affordability. Well, and this is where I can start to share some of the feedback from my lecture breakers audience. Yes. When I asked them, you know, should we keep this conference or what? Oh my goodness. Okay. So affordability was number one. Like yeah. that was the most popular one because you got people flying from all over the world to try to go to this one destination. And, you know, um, I mean, COVID has added a whole nother layer to the stress of flying, but even prior mm-hmm. to COVID it was already stressful. Mm-hmm. It was already expensive. Hotel rooms were already expensive and, you know, it's just a lot of, resources going into this two or three day event. Um, so affordability was the, no, was the, uh, the number one response from, from my audience. And so I hear you on that one. And the mm-hmm. second one, can I just jump in and say the second one, it, please. the mm-hmm. second one was family responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Like so many people were, I mean, these two are neck and neck. So many people were taking care of elderly family members or they have children or just, you know, they're balancing all the things these days. And it's like, you know, if I can go in my office mm-hmm. and I can participate in this conference without having to think about, I've got to get get, you know, on this flight and I've got a five hour flight and then I got to get there and then I'm away from my kids all this time. I mean, it was really, really stressful. And I think Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, affordability and, and being there with your family or being able to coordinate around family responsibilities. I mean, those are two very, very popular responses from my audience. Yeah. And those are two really big ones. So, yeah. Well, and as a speaker, just to throw it back one second to the speaker, uh, uh, this this is the same for me. I mean, I have a six-year-old and, you know, I I didn't like leaving him when he was a baby. Mm -hmm. And so I I love that I can be home with him and I can coordinate. Mm -hmm. I can go record, do some things for my, for my conference and then, you know, get back to, to playtime and Legos, (laughs) you know, so uh, priorities. (laughs) Like you could be home for dinner with family or whatever family events you, you have lined up. So, or friends or just, you know what other commitments you have. Yeah. And family or friends, any of those. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, I support both of those as a speaker, as a conference organizer, as mom, as a presenter, like all the things I'm like, yes, those are the top two for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think those are big ones. I think another one is, um, the possibility for being so much more accessible in an online setting. Um, Absolutely. You can do closed captions. You can do transcripts. There's a chat so you can talk to people um, in that way. Um, you can do ASL on, on the screen and have someone doing that on video. I mean, I, I just think um, those types of accessibility um, 
it's, it's just like a huge benefit of, of online settings. I agree. And I mean, I can't think of how many times I've not been able to hear a presenter, you know, at a conference and that's frustrating or somebody in the audience says, I have a question. I don't need the mic. I'm a teacher. You need the mic. Like th- these are things we don't have to deal with, you know, with, yeah. I mean, these are things we don't have to deal with when it's, when it's online. Uh, you can turn the mic over and everybody can hear everybody or, you know, you can, like say, provide those closed captionings, provide all those uh, sort of universal design for learning mm-hmm. resources that we all benefit from. So I really appreciate this one. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, and I do want to emphasize that it's possible for this to happen. So if you are a conference organizer, this is sort of an encouragement on your end to make sure that you are adding these things in. Uh, you know, I have, of course, heard of situations or cases where they didn't do this. Um, I, I mean, most of the time, I don't see this happening for in-person conferences either. So I actually think, you know, this is something that all conferences could really um, probably do better and consider regardless of, of setting. Um, I just also think online settings could make this easier or even more affordable to make happen compared well, to uh, in-person. Yeah. And Echo, this was top of mind for me. So one of the things I think like higher education, um, which both of us, we work in this space, we are really miles ahead of the game when it comes to accessibility than what we saw with uh, people sort of in the online space world, um, being able to provide uh, resources for everybody to learn from. Like, here's an example. So uh, the first time I did the Lecture Breakers Conference, um, I could not find any automated program at all. And keep in mind, this was 2020, okay? There was nothing that would do closed captions or transcripts for me automated. So mm-hmm. I had to hire a team to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't mean hire a team like there were my people. I mean, I reached out to a company. Yeah. I hired live transcribers to do it. It's very expensive. And, but I was like, no, this is like top priority. I have to have closed captioning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I could send away for transcripts. That was fine. Um, and so all that worked out. Um, but then just a year later in 2021, now it's like, yeah. it was, it was, it was probably 20 times cheaper. Uh, to to do the closed captionings and nice. the transcripts than it was from one year to the next. So the, okay. the online business space, the tech gurus out there, they're they're trying to catch up with what All we've right. always been doing in higher ed. And then the other side of this, um, I, so I've been a presenter uh, more than once where I had a, a participant in the audience who was deaf. And so I had to always make sure they, they always had the, the conference providers provided a translator uh, for me or for them, I'm sorry, to go around the conference. And so they would just make sure to touch base with me as a speaker beforehand. And what I had to make, I had to be really conscious of Mm -hmm. making sure my face was always available to the, Mm -hmm. to both of them, to everybody, because they could read lips as well. Mm -hmm. But it was just, it it was like always top of mind for me to make sure that my events were accessible, no matter what. And so, um, like I said, I just want to put a plug out there to say, this is getting not cheaper, but more affordable. And, <laughs> yeah. and it's something that finally is being recognized right. in the online space. As it should. Yeah. Yeah. How about, um, we, I think we've talked a lot about networking. Yeah. I don't know. Do we want to keep going with networking? I mean, there's, uh, there's so much with networking. There's just so many more opportunities and we have so yeah. many tech tools that allow and support mm-hmm. for support networking now that it, it can be an authentic experience. So yeah. um, I know we had that on our list, but I don't know how much we want to talk about it. I think we checked that one off. Okay. Especially the one about how in a chat room, you can connect with other participants. So yeah. Um, The other one is having a lot less overwhelm and more control over the learning environment, Mm -hmm. which is part accessibility because it's really important for people with certain disabilities or people who are neuro divergent. Um, so, you know, just, just having that control and ability to do things like stop and take breaks, reduce your own cognitive overload, you know, not having to be on camera and just, just being able to sit there and listen without worrying about people watching you and things like that. And knowing that there are replays so that you can go back and watch the information. I mean, I think that helps so many people. Yes. And I totally agree with this because it's, it's so important. One of the things that I learned is, um, so, so the way that my conference is organized right now is it runs three, I run three 45 minute sessions, which turns to about an hour. So three, one hour sessions, um, 
on a uh, three days, like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And the first time I did the conference, I only allowed a 15 minute break between because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do this, you know, and I quickly learned that I need to allow more time <laughs> between yeah. not only for me, but for them, everybody appreciated a half hour to grab coffee mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can, you can control that better. You're not paying extra for the space. You're not paying extra for people to clean the room or stay over time. And so you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to control yep. that whole learning environment. So yes, I, totally support this one. Yeah, I think, again, when, when a lot of people talk about the advantages of an in-person conference, I really feel sometimes that people are only thinking of people who have a lot of resources and people who are so-called, you know, neurotypical, basically. Um, and, and they're sort of forgetting about the people who maybe don't have those resources, can't go, and or, you know, an in-person conference environment is kind of a nightmare for some people. And that, that was my experience. Like I, like people say that in-person conferences are great for networking, but I'm going to be honest and <laughs> with everybody, this is sort of the first time I'm really talking about this, but I would go to in-person conferences and I would often do my presentation and then I would just go hide in a corner. <laughs> Like I, I, mm -hmm. I was not out there socializing and networking with people. Like that was way too much for me. I just couldn't do it. Like I, I just couldn't do it. It was way too overwhelming and stressful. And I didn't have my breaks. I didn't have what I needed to make that successful. So I, I really feel like that's forgotten about in, in a lot of these conversations, conversations, which is why I'm glad that we're talking about all these things, sort of bring this to light because certain people are just forgotten about and, and, um, when, when we have these conversations, so, but in a virtual setting, man, I was there like typing, <laughs> networking. I was spending the time of my life when previously conferences were one of the worst experiences that I would have to like go home and I would have to take days just to recover. And I know I'm not alone here. Comment below if this is you. <laughs> it's just so right. So we all feel less alone. And that's why I'm saying this out loud because we're meant to feel like there's something wrong with us and that, that this isn't an experience that people have. But I know others feel this way too, where it's a very draining and stressful experience. And so, um, so and, and because of the environment. So virtual settings really can create a, a very empowering and positive environment for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. I mean, yeah. from one introvert to another, I mean, I hear you. Oh. <laughs> I don't, you don't have to say you are, but I know that you are by what you just said. Oh, so <laughs> um, I'm the same way. So, um, and people are often surprised that I'm an introvert because when I'm presenting, I'm just a dynamic speaker and I love to talk to people before and after my session. Um, I love to walk around to the tables and talk to people. I, you know, it's always been fun to be a vendor where people come up and they're like, oh, what's your latest book? Let let me check it out. Will you sign it? Like, I love that. But then I like need to close it down. Like it's time for me to go and just quietly recover <laughs> um, for the next thing. And like, I, I love to, you know, grab a cup of coffee or tea or something in a corner. Like you just said, whether that's in the airport coming home or just in the corner at the hotel or back in my room, I just have to decompress. And I have to, like, it takes a lot for me to do all of that. You know, it just, so I agree with you completely. And I totally understand mm -hmm. that. And the online space allows me Mm -hmm. to participate in a different way and show up yeah. in a different way. I just yes. really appreciate those options. Mm -hmm. And that's so. another thing too, like participating. I also, again, in an in-person conference, me and, you know, I know others feel the same that, you know, we don't really get our questions answered. We don't really have our voice heard. We're, we're sort of more passive participants and, and there isn't space. It isn't easy to say things out loud and, and it isn't easy to get our question um, answered. But in a virtual setting, all of that seemed so easy and so possible. I was able to ask more questions and just, again, participate. And I felt so much more active in an online setting compared to yeah. in person. Well, and it, it's so frustrating for me as a participant and as a speaker to have someone ask a question or me ask a question, I'd never get an answer. And right? online, I feel, yeah, like online, I feel <gasps> like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see that question and we're going to answer it, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, is there anything else? Anything um, you think of? Uh, the, I mean, we've talked about just the stress of travel and time zones mm, and and yes. all of that, and and I think that's an important one. Um, you know, so I'm on the east coast of North Carolina, and I've done several conferences that are, you know, on the west coast, and mm. that's a tough trip coming home where you mm. lose all that time, and it's just a lot to have to make yeah. those adjustments and 
And um, I don't think we realize how much that can wear us down, especially if you're the the speaker, you know, you're just like, oh my gosh, now I have to go be on stage and I, it's three o'clock AM at my time right now, you know? So I think that uh, the ability to record, to offer things in lots of different ways online is just such a a game changer when it comes to uh, taking our work global. Mm -hmm. So I agree. I agree. uh, So, Um, wow. This was a great list. This was a great list. Yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah, hopefully, you know, for those of you who are watching, I really hope that, um, you know, this, this was eye opening because we really do think that all of these reasons, especially put together really, um, is why virtual presentations or online or virtual conferences, online conferences have the potential to be significantly more diverse, inclusive, and equitable compared to in-person conferences so well and they're also more engaging I think I don't know I I, I know there's something to be said about engaging in the in-person space but there's a different way that we get engaged and connect online and I think it's just as valuable I've learned so much about myself and Mm -hmm. others Mm -hmm. through this whole process and so I just think that Online conferences can be very engaging learning environments, uh, especially if you know how to design for that, um, both as a conference organizer and as a presenter. Um, And so, you know, I just want to encourage people that, you know, make sure that if you are interested in online conferences, you can reach out to me about the whole process of organizing one, reach out to Echo for like, if you're a speaker and you want to make your presentation materials, more engaging. And, uh, you know, if you are not interested in doing online conferences, or you want to think about something beyond online conferences, but still in the professional development space, then come and check out the video on my channel. So Echo will be joining me on my channel. And we're going to talk about all the different virtual professional development things that you might not have thought about. Conferences are not the only one. There's so many creative things that we can do. And so we're going to explore that on my channel in our next video. So excited. Again, all the links um, are in the description below. Like and subscribe to my channel. I totally forgot to plug that. Um, (laughs) And make sure you do the same for Barbie. Like and subscribe on Barbie's channel and to check out our video there. But thank you so much for watching. And I really hope that this was helpful and interesting. And yeah, have a good day. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.